there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Paul Burrow clawed his way from a northern mining town into the heart of the royal family. The most beautiful woman in the world was my best friend. She shouldn't have let me come that close. She was my raison d'etre. And my life had finished. But he was attacked by the world's press for divulging royal secrets. On Diana's death, you sold out. If you know the truth, you have to be brave enough to stand up and say it. Can therapist Mandy Saligari help Paul deal with his demons? Would you have challenged her eating disorder? I was doing my duty. That gay thing was a monster. She was dead. And I remember saying to her, why didn't you take me with you? Good morning. How are you? I'm actually feeling a little bit apprehensive because I've never been in therapy and I don't know what to expect. I know here. This is where I used to come with the princess. And this is where I would drop her off to go into colonic irrigation and then drive around the block a few times and pick her up. At 58, Paul is going into therapy for the first time. Hello. Hello. Take a seat. Thank you. My first question really is, do you have any kind of preconceptions of therapy or what do you think it is? I think it's a sort of a, an intrusion into my world. OK. So my guard's up. OK. What is it that you would like to get out of this? Because my intention is that this is real mm -hmm. therapy. Well, there are two issues in my life which have, have really bothered me. No, perhaps three. The passing of the princess and my sexuality. And I've never understood why I was so vilified in the media. OK. They've caused me problems. And my sexuality, of course, I've only just come to terms with. I came out. And that was the one thing that has been dogging me all my life. And I eventually faced that demon because I found someone whom I love very much and want to spend the rest of my life with. In 2016, Paul, father of two, divorced his wife of 32 years, Maria. Now, she was living in America. I was living here. It's not rocket science to work out the fact that the marriage isn't actually working. So I was alone, running the flower shop, and this man came into my world. After 10 years of keeping his relationship out of the press, Paul announced he would be marrying his partner, Graham Cooper, known as Coop. I've been searching all my life to find my soulmate and never realised it would be a man at the end. But then, in the past, because of my upbringing, it was the most shameful thing that anyone could ever do. Why is it a demon? Because it's always been there, that black cloud. A black cloud? It's always followed me around. That gay thing. It's a monster. Why is it a monster or a demon or a black cloud? I hear so many threatening descriptions. Well, because, you see, I grew up in a coal mining community in the north of England, and so it was, um, I suppose, suppressed for so many years and not allowed to come out. It would be a shaming thing. It would be something which would disgrace my family. And for me, it was something to hide. The eldest of three brothers, Paul was born in the coal mining village of Grassmoor, near Chesterfield. My future was to join my family and become a coal miner, and I didn't want to go down the pit. Paul ate dirt. He ate to gain his hands dirty. And I mean, to be a coal miner, that's one thing you're going to be, dirt black. Thinking about it now, it may have been because of my sexuality that I felt and thought differently to other kids of my own age. It weren't spoke about, but I think it were always different. It didn't channel the path that we channeled. The perception today is, what does it matter? 
But back then, it did. Can I ask, what made you think you didn't want to go down the mines? I think I was considered special. What does that mean? By my mother. I think she saw how kind and soft and gentle I was. In fact, I remember as a child someone saying to me, what a lovely little girl. And that stuck out in my head. And I, I wonder how your dad reacted to that, to see in his eldest son a lovely little girl called Paul. <laughs> you know. That had a dolly. OK. The dolly was hid in the gas cupboard. Because? I wasn't allowed to have that dolly. Because? It wasn't right for a boy to have a dolly. But your mum indulged it? Yes. But your dad wouldn't have tolerated it? No, so it was hidden. From dad? In a Clark's shoebox. OK, so it's <laughs> hidden from dad, and dad is representative of what is right and wrong? Yes, he's the masculine male figure of the family, and you're to follow this example. So there is a seismic split right through your family? Yes, and, I'm, mum and, dad. and I'd rather cling to my mother's apron strings. Yeah. What's really important about Paul hiding the doll in the cupboard is that he grew up knowing that there was something about him that his mother would indulge, if you like, but she also made sure that that secret was kept. And I think that that will have given him a sense of shame. There's something about me that's not OK for the outside world. And I think it set Paul up to feel quite confused about himself, and I think it made him secretive from the outset. I have always been looking for love and acceptance. When you talk about, um, I've always wanted love and acceptance, my thought is, why, didn't he have love and acceptance as a child? Mm, but I lost it. You lost it? I lost my mum. Breathe. Uh, that moves you. My mum, yes, mm. he does. I think of her almost every day. I lost her and the princess in one year. So two of the most inspirational women in my life were suddenly not there. M may I just remark? Mm. I noticed you were talking about your mum mm. and you went straight to linking the loss of your mum to the link. So I see that there's not a clean ending on your mum because just in the way you talk about it, mm. you've attached it to somebody else. Yes. So your dad, did he love and accept you? Yes. As you are, not wanting to go down the pit? Yes, he did. But I feared telling him, always telling him about my sexuality. That's the one thing I feared. His discipline ruled, and there was a belt that was on the back of the door with a big buckle on it. If we stepped out of line or we had, we had to be disciplined, that belt would be taken off of that hook. I hid behind my mum. And did your mum protect you? Yes. Did she stop you from being belted? Yes. So she sought to protect you, perhaps mm. in a way she didn't, your brothers? Did yes. she never intervene on them? No. My middle brother probably had the punishment for all of us. But she intervened on your father's discipline? Yes. What did that cause between father and mother? Problems, obviously, because he, his masculinity was, was neutered. Tell me, what do you remember? I remember... I remember her screaming and saying, leave him alone, leave him alone, don't touch him. And I was hiding away my sexuality in that gas cupboard frightened of what he might say. It's the power of secrets. But I like secrets. I know you do. They're very valuable to me, secrets. Paul Burrell is exploring the shame he has felt over his sexuality. What do you know of shame? I remember kneeling beside my bed around about 11 and praying to God not to make me like this. Just make me normal, normal, not different. I knew I was different at 11, thinking I might be attracted to men. And that was a shame. How could I survive and be that different? Because I had nobody to refer to, mm. nobody to look up to. I had no role model. Mm -hmm. I was alone. I wonder what you would have done if your mother hadn't protected you in the family home. I don't know. I think that... She saved me. OK, saved. I mean, these are big... These are big words. These are trauma 
associated words. But I didn't want to upset my family or bring shame to my family. So from a very early age, you were taught how to... Play a role. Play a role. It's quite clear to me now that Paul expects people to see something in him that they don't like. He expects to be rejected. And as a result, he comes in with all this kind of defence mechanisms. And getting past that is quite a challenge. All is not as it seems with him. He has learnt to play a role. He's learnt to perform. And I think it's going to be very difficult for him to settle down and just be Paul. How are you today? I'm feeling fine. When you say fine, what feelings are encapsulated? Control. Fine. OK, that's interesting. I'm now in control. Right. It's difficult for me to open up. Very difficult. Yeah, I Living agree. in a world of discipline and total control, in a world where you can't talk about anything, brainwashed in, in an environment where you're not allowed to have feelings. And I think that's the, the, the control I must... I have to control what people think of me. Mm. Because if I don't, I am critically vulnerable. Yes. Because the truth of me could bring the whole house of cards down. I was vulnerable going to secondary school in a school full of 500 boys. Yeah. An old boys school wasn't a good place to send me to. I, I hated it. I hated school. Boys that Paul were in school were... were were boy, proper boy, big boys, do you know what I mean? And it was a frightening world for such as Paul. Every single day, walking into every lesson, that stomach churning, nervousness, every single day of my school life. Mm -hmm. Until a boy actually saw my vulnerability and protected me from the rest. And he was my champion. Because of him, I was able to go to school. How did you feel about him? I suppose I had a crush on him and didn't even know it. This is a theme through your life. This idea that you would slipstream someone or tuck under the wing of someone mm. that you perceive to be stronger. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised that you would experience having a crush because you are being protected from profound threat. Mm. So you are going to feel intense feelings in that relationship. Because without him, you would have been... Lost. Life would have been unbearable. <laughs> yes. Life would have been unbearable. Mm. I think it's almost like what I would describe a love addiction. A person or an experience gets so close that it attaches to you at a cellular level, mm. which means that when it's gone, you live in craving. Mm. I will be your special person. Mm -hmm. I will be loyal. Yes. I will back you up to the hilt. I yeah. will die for you. Yes. Just keep me safe. Yes. So it is... You're describing my life. But the, the negative side of that was that you had absolutely no coping skills no. whatsoever. No. It's, I've been exactly there. It's the parasite that eats you alive because you also... No, you can't... I, it's... It's complete addiction. Yes, it is. How can you stop that? Yeah. So, therefore, presumably, your first love was a boy. Well, well yes, of, of course it was. I mean, I remember my first real experience I was a boy and I didn't want that. Mm. It's, it, it was exciting, but I didn't want it. So after, afterwards, did you it. feel ashamed? Yes, totally okay. shame. I don't want that. Back to praying. OK, breathe a moment, because yeah. that's, that must have been quite scary. Yes. Why, why do I carry so much guilt and shame? OK, good question. Probably because some of it's not yours. The fact that society wouldn't accept it, mm. your parents wouldn't accept it, and your mother knowing about it but never talking about it will actually reinforce that. This isn't OK, this is a secret, we mm. can't talk about no. it. So there is a part of me that I really like <laughs> that has to be secret. Yes. But I like secrets. I know you do. I know you I do. Like, they're very valuable to me, secrets. I think they are exactly that. I think they're a commodity to you. Yes. I think but... your secrets are where your shame lay, but I think in recognising that, you know that power lies in secrets. Because somebody yeah. could have had power over you if they'd discovered your secret. Yes. So what's the flip side of that? If I have a secret, I have power over you.
It's the power of secrets. But I'm not Machiavellian. Is that what I said? It sounds like that. It's a simple observation. Right. I don't think I'm clever enough to be Machiavellian. As a general rule of thumb, it is clever to be dumb. Yes. I think that you have a very interesting hiding place that you have learned to fall back into. And I really get a sense of why when we talk as much as we have about I, your early I, days. I, don't, I really don't understand what you're saying. Is it... Um, Careful. Is it really me or is it somebody else? You tell me. <laughs> I find myself wondering, are you just role-playing to people please me to kind of position yourself and give me what you think I want? Or are you actually being yourself? And that's incredibly difficult to know with him. There is something about you that is so constructed. I mean, you are so constructed. I noticed in the last session that you provide little stories and vignettes and things too. And I think that when you do that, you miss detail, and I think you're capable of saying, here's this experience, edit it out, tell a story, throw in the odd negative and the odd positive, but at the end of the day, happy ending, bow, boom, done. Yes. And, and that is definitely control. I call it surviving. Yes, I, I agree. And it makes me wonder if the consequence of that today mm -hmm. is how do you know, oh, it's going to sound really weird, but how do you know what's actually real? What is actually real if you're so used to constructing things? That's an interesting question because maybe I don't. It's Paul Burrell that I'm talking to. I want to talk to Paul. Paul. I think you're quite right. I don't think Paul has come to your session. I think Paul Burrell has come to your session. I'm not sure whether Paul would come. Therapy's going okay. I'm not sure. I think we're at a junction. I think it's going to get very personal and very deep from now on. And I'm going to have to not open the floodgates because it's a very emotional subject for me. I still live in the presence of Diana. I can't comprehend my life without that woman because the two cannot be separated. I'm living with a happy ghost. And if I'm told to leave this happy ghost behind, I'm gonna walk out the door because I'm not gonna leave this behind. Hello. Hello, how are you? Come on in. Good. Today, we can go to Buckingham Palace. It's a place I know very well. Yeah. How are you feeling right this second? Anxious. OK. I spent all my life keeping secrets and all my life not telling anyone anything. And my brain is still telling me, don't say that, don't go there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm feeling. In 1976, at 18, Paul was offered a job far away from the mines of Grassmoor as a butler at Buckingham Palace. I fell into it as if it was second nature. I loved the uniforms. I loved the theatre. I think he was very devoted, and maybe as a result, he, he became a little obsessed with the whole royal world. His devotion quickly caught the Queen's attention. I got elevated in the first year from the very bottom to the very top. I skipped over people who had been there for 10, 15, 20 years. You don't think they were very happy, do you? Of course they weren't happy. From what I understand, people said that he would whisper, you know, about other members of staff and they would suddenly disappear or they would be out of favour. So he could be quite Machiavellian. Suddenly, I was in the Queen's presence. I had her ears. And I'm the centre of all of that power. The relationship with my mother sort of stopped and I sort of moved it to the Queen and saw her 
as that strong figure in my life. How come you had a vacancy in your life for the quasi-mother figure, if you like? I was too busy looking forward and I didn't look back. But this wasn't just an ordinary woman. This is our queen. Yeah. This is our monarch. Yeah. This is the, the most famous woman in the world yeah. who I suddenly found myself living alongside for 11 years. Your pattern has been to find someone or somebody find you, mm. whichever it may be, and then you tuck in close. And I thought I was indestructible. But in 1981, Paul's relationship with the Queen would be tested. There was supposed to be some incident, I'm sure it's probably the easiest way of putting it, on the Royal Yacht Britannia, which was a bit of a scandal, led to a lot of dismissals, and, and Paul was supposed to be involved in some way with that. That is not true. That's newspaper talk and completely untrue. I had a relationship with someone who was in the Royal Navy, and he worked on the Royal Yacht Britannia. They found letters from me to him, and that brought everything to a head. The Queen didn't blame me at all, but that's when she said to me, it's time for you to look for a wife. I felt as if I was being manoeuvred in, and pushed into a little place. And is that what precipitated your marriage to hmm. your wife, well, ex-wife? When you've given advice like that, you don't... I didn't feel that it was Why wrong. Why would she do it? Well, I don't know. I'd have, I'd have to go back and ask her. But I surprised myself. I fell in love with her. In 1984, Paul made the decision to marry Prince Philip's maid, Maria Cosgrove. It did throw me when he got married. That was, I thought, oh. I think even Maria, when they got married, was told by the of members of the staff, are you sure you're doing the right thing? Because you know that he's gay. We are very popular with the royals but not so popular with downstairs. Suddenly, we were a powerful couple to deal with inside the royal household. And we had not only the Queen's ear, but Prince Philip's ear as well now. We were protected from everything and everybody by the Queen and Prince Philip. You know, when you were married, mm. did you think Maria knew about your sexuality? Yes, we had no secrets. But, but she was the centre of my world for a, for a short time. Until Princess Diana took that space. I know that Princess Diana had an eating disorder. It was very well reported. And I'd, ha I'd help her with that. So that she could be sick. Paul Burrell is in therapy, talking about his time working for the royal family. In 1987, having served under the Queen for 11 years, Paul moved to the position of butler to Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Why did you leave the Queen? How did that happen? Because Diana came into my life. But how did it happen? I knew her when she was 18 years old and she came as a stranger into, into the royal family. She'd been invited to Balmoral for the weekend and she arrived at the door and she was lost. And I said, I'll show you to her room. She said, well, you wouldn't stay for a while and have a chat, would you? I, I'm out of my depth here. So she befriended me and she became married to Prince Charles and then her family started to grow. And I remember her one day, she pushed me into the dining room, it's pitch black, and she shut the door and she said, put, put your hand on my tummy. I said, you're a royal, royal princess, I can't do that. So she took my hand and put it on her tummy. And she said, you feel that? I said, yes. She said, it's a boy. I said, please don't tell me that. That's the biggest secret at the moment. Yeah. If that comes out, you'll know that I've said, I've told someone. She said, no, I think it's safe with you. But you tell it now. You know, It's it different now. But you asked me the question right at the start. I want to know why I was vilified. And if somebody tells you secrets and you say, I will never tell anyone, mm. why does that ever change? Because part of being vilified mm. might be that on Diana's death, you sold out. But history was being written by other people who were writing also about me, were not writing the truth. And I strongly believe if you know the truth, you have to be brave enough to stand up and say it. What, um, because I find myself thinking the, the mistake, if that's what it is, 
is to get in so close. I couldn't help it. She's the most beautiful woman in the world, in every way. And how could I help that? The thing was, of course, she shouldn't have let me come that close. Because there's a line, and I knew where the line was. That's what I'm interested in. Yes. Do you know where the line is? Because I think yes. that exactly your do. terminology is interesting that you know the line. Because every morning I would stand waiting for her to come through from bre for breakfast. And I would stand waiting with a half a grapefruit and a cup of black coffee. And she'd come through and I'd bow and say, good morning, Royal Highness. And she'd always say, oh, for goodness sakes, how long do we have to play this game? Why don't you just sit down and have a cup of coffee with me? When she invited me over that line, into her world, I was there for her, could be there for her, in any possible configuration. In 1992, the royal couple separated. Paul had been serving them for five years. Charles said to her, well, you can take whatever you want, take it, get out. So she wrote a list, and on the top of that list, she put my name. And I realized now why she wanted me there, because she had no one else. Being attached to Diana was an enormous thrill. It's a drug, and the more you want it, the more you want more of it. She became very needy, and I became very needy. We both became dependent on each other, to the point where she didn't speak to me one morning, I'd fall into a complete state. Princess Diana was, a, was quite Machiavellian. She would play one member of staff off against the other. She would say that you're the most important person to her member of staff one day and the next day they would be out of favour when she wouldn't speak to them um, for days and weeks on end. There was nothing in my world other than Diana. And even when I got home, the phone would ring. I need you. And my wife said, she's your baby. When she cries, you go running. I said, yes, I do. I do. The compulsive caretaker whose identity is ratified by being indispensable to another person, so that this person is indispensable and special to this person who is truly brilliant but flawed. It's very important. So this person will compensate for their flaws, and this person says, I don't know where I'd be without you. And you have a relationship of dependence. And I know that Princess Diana had an eating disorder. It was very well reported. And I'd, I'd help her with that. How did you try to help her with that? I'd get the chef to prepare a gallon of custard. And I'd buy yogurts and lots of bananas. So that she could be sick? And I'd prepare the room for her to make sure she was comfortable. Make sure there was a pile of towels and... What do you think of that? I was doing my duty. I'd have done anything for Diana. Would you have challenged her eating disorder and refused to provide custard? I wasn't able to challenge. What but you said happening. you would have done anything. Yes. But what I'm saying, you would have done anything to enable whatever she was doing, even if it was self-destructive. I couldn't tell her what to do. If she were taking heroin, would you have injected it into her arm? Uh, no, I think that's, that's a much more serious. I don't. You don't. But when I hear you say that, I'm hearing you saying, I would do anything for mm. her, mm. except challenge a self-destructive behavior. I could be there. I could put my arm around her. If you love someone, who is suffering from any self-destructive pattern of behavior, never think that you're not qualified to challenge. If you don't feel qualified, go and get the support. You, any family member who is worried about someone that they love, mm. can go and seek support and say, what do I do? Because as a therapist, I say, the most loving act is me standing here saying, I do not want your blood on my hands. I do not want to provide you with custard. I love you so much that I'm prepared to piss you off. Do you feel like you've compromised your moral code? No. So you're loyal to a person, not to a moral code. Whatever that person tells you to do, you will do because you're loyal to them. I think, it, I think if it was illegal, I'd question it, yes. This wasn't illegal, as far as I was aware. That's where your worth lies. That I'll be your rock, 
I'll get to know you really well. I will anticipate your need and I will protect you. And you will value me as a result and, and I you, will keep you safe. That's what I did. When you were very long, young, you had to be loyal to a person to say thank you for what they did for you, right? Yes. Therefore, you were primed to be loyal to a person and almost ignore what any moral code might be because this is what... This was your primary right. motivation. Yes. yes, and over the years I've, I've ignored my wife and my children. That's right. And, and people haven't understood that. So it's your primary I've been motive. I've focused. Right. Duty, loyalty, yes. fulfil that, and basically everything else goes beside. Yes. So as a result of that, what you're doing is you are abandoning yourself in favour of doing what you perceive will keep you safe. Yes. Which is to enmesh. That will set you up for resentment. On the 31st of August, 1997, along with the rest of the world, Paul mourned the death of Princess Diana. But he had recently suffered another terrible loss. My mother had died 10 months before the princess. Mm. She died in Canada. Okay. And when she came home, I kissed her, and she was cold and hard like marble. And yet when I sat with the princess in Paris, she was soft and warm, and I couldn't relate the two experiences. So I actually couldn't come to terms with her death from the very, very beginning. Did you properly grieve your mum, do you think? No. I really hear that. People are very lucky that, that they get the chance to embrace their loved ones and say goodbye properly, or have time to do that. I didn't, it was robbed. And I'm 59 years old tomorrow, and my mum was 59 years old when she died. So I have to live the rest of my life thinking that these are the years you never had. And in a way, I'm doing that for the princess too. Stay with your mum for a minute, because what you've done is done exactly what you said happened, which is you start to talk about your mum and you move into the princess. Yeah. So there's an enmeshment between the two which prevents you. It means that your emotion that is raised in you around your mother is borrowed by the princess and then possibly processed through that way, which means the stuff around your mum's left just left suspended. Yes, the two the two are, are one and the same. But they're not in my head. But they're not. No, I know that, but in my head they are the same. And I'm making it explicit for you. Yeah. I suspect that when your mum died, you were so caught up in the princess's world yes. as well mm. that you really weren't have been available, really, no. for anybody else anyway, no. because you will be consumed by this world. I mean consumed mm. to You're the right. exclusion of anything else. But then you see when, when she died, there was no one else for anyone to turn to to say, where is yeah. this? Where are all the secrets? Where, where's that? What did she do then? So... I found myself in that world without Diana. And I'd find myself in her rooms and I could smell her perfume and I could hear her voice. And for me, it was cathartic and I was back there. And I'd find myself in the bottom of her wardrobe, asleep amongst her clothes. It was the only way I could try and get her back into my world. Nobody came and said, are you all right? Nobody said, do you need help? They just left me there. It was a very difficult time for me. I can hear that. And there wasn't anyone there, no one. I think there was genuine concern about the state of his, his health mentally at the time. He was very, very upset, obviously but probably more than people thought would be normal. He should have probably had therapy then. What's stopping you from letting go of whatever relationships you've had in the past, banking what's precious, but not in such a way that it trips you up moving forward, right? That, that's the key. But I don't want to let go. No, no, because no, to let go would be... I don't want her exorcised. Mm. I'm happy with her. I went, when she came back to Kensington Palace for that last night, 
I pulled up a chair and sat with her. And I said, you know, it's just like old times, just me and you back here. She was there in the room. I knew, I knew she was there. I could feel this very heavy atmosphere in the room. And I remember saying to her, why didn't you take me with you? Why didn't you take me with you? It would be much easier. She did. She took a piece of you. She took a piece of you because you're still stuck there. There's lots of these shoulds and if onlys kicking around inside you. And it's left you stuck back there. And it stops you from being able to be in the right now and in relationship. I can really see how hard it is for you to do that. Not least because what you've become attached to was so iconic and finished in such a dramatic way. And also not wanting to let go of it because this is almost a defining feature of you. Mm -hmm. yes, and I wonder, I wonder what would be left of Paul if he really did detach from, from Diana and the palace and all of that and really close that chapter and move on. My husband said to me, let's put this picture away mm. of Diana. I said, no, can't put her away. No. She's part of my life, she's part of my world. But there's a third person in your marriage. <laughs> you can't say that. I absolutely can. That's ridiculous. And there were three people in your first marriage because your first wife had to share you and your second marriage has to share you with a ghost. Well, there are three people in your marriage and it's up to you, actually, to make the choice to live if you wish in the present. It never occurred to me that there are three people in my marriage. How can I tell one of them to leave? I don't know how to say, I'll always love you, but I have to say goodbye to you. I don't personally think that we've got to the bottom or even touched on some of the trauma that you've experienced in your life. And your instinct could be right. Paul Burrell is in therapy exploring his relationship with Princess Diana. So if your intent is to reduce the impact of Princess Diana on your life today, mm. my advice to you is if you mean business, seize the day. I think I will take your advice on that. I think I will embrace Coop into that equation and ask him which things I should put away. No and to help me? No. No? No. He must not be responsible. You are responsible. You're responsible for you. I'm so doing it again, aren't you I? You are doing it. You're removing the focus from you and taking responsibility for yourself and you're deferring it <laughs> to somebody else to whom you will give undying loyalty <laughs> and then you will tuck him behind them and say, I couldn't have possibly done it without you, whilst drawing them into your world where you both end up getting enmeshed. And I shouldn't do that, should I? Because that's naughty. He doesn't do any favours. Well, it's, I mean, naughty is a way of putting it that has a charm about it that's seeking <laughs> me to enable you, and I'm not going to. You're right. What's come out of this session is loving someone isn't enabling them. Uh, spot on. Paul tells me that he wants his marriage to work. He also tells me that he knows he needs to let go of Diana. And in order for the marriage to work, he does need to let go and that can't be done by anyone else other than him. How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm very relaxed, very yeah. comfortable today. OK. I had a very good week. So, relaxed, comfortable... Yes, happy. Happy. It feels as if I... she's left me. It feels as if I've moved on. What's the feeling? Do you know what the emotion is? Well, she's been with me for such a long time. It's very difficult, and as I said to you from the beginning, it's very difficult for me to let go of her. And I think she is moving away. That's what I feel. It's as if I've just let go of the, the anchor or the tether, and it's, it's OK. I'm feeling it's OK to let go. I am what I am. It's me. Paul's here. It's like, come on, <laughs> what do you got for me? Because it doesn't matter anymore. That's what it feels like. Yes. I'm not wearing cufflinks. Oh, yeah. I put the Diana cufflinks away. Okay. They're gone. My Diana cufflinks are in the box in the safe. Are they? Yes. 
I always wore my Diana cufflinks yeah. everywhere I went. Everywhere, every event I went, every time I spoke about her, she was on my sleeve. I couldn't let go of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why part of me is still there, mm -hmm. still stuck inside a palace. I can imagine that that would be intoxicating. You're letting me slip back into that world. Can you resist it? Uh, you see, I just gorged the top layer of a box of milk tray, sat here with you. Please don't let me gorge the second layer. You are responsible for you. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into the second layer. Excellent. It's not alcohol or drug addiction, but it is a form of that, isn't it? Because it, yeah. it is an aphrodisiac. When somebody starts talking about their qualifier, whoever or whatever that is, they will feed. We'll you, just let, you just let me do that, then. Every time you talk about this, you are high risk of, if you're not already, relapsing. I consider you to be willful, um, arrogant, because I believe that you think that you can fall off the wagon and get back on again. And it informs me that you haven't yet managed to digest the level of respect, I think, that this deserves in terms of how destructive it is for you. What I want to do is not open the box. That's right. I don't want to see the chocolates. That's right. I don't want to open that box. That's right. And there are times in, in the past week or so... Until there is enough of you. Yes, until there's enough of me. Paul, enough is enough of Paul. Yeah. And this, this last week, I've seen Paul peeping out. I like him. Good. So give him some time. I think that's who Coop fell in love with, Paul. He didn't fall in love with Paul Burrell. So it doesn't matter if Paul Burrell disappears, really, as long as Paul survives. How do you feel right now? Happy. I never thought I would experience this. I never thought I would get professional help. And it's helped me. And I'm better for it. So my thought to you would be, I think that you have constructed realities, constructed truths, invested in fantasy. Your stories, your vignettes that we noticed in the first session have a, you sort of draw them from a library to tell a story and they have a start, a middle and an end. Ta-da! Little bow, yeah. end. <laughs> yeah, and off it goes. There's a lot still for you to do if you want to commit to this. And mm. I think that this year will be enormously challenging for you. In my brain, it goes back to the gas cupboard and Dolly in the shoebox. That's where it began. And that's where the shame should stay. There, in that gas cupboard. It, it should have stayed there, but it didn't. It, 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 like a cancer, it sort of went into my life. The stigma, the shame, that terrible monster that was slain. I don't personally think that we've got to the bottom or even touched on some of the trauma that you've experienced in your life is my instinct, my professional instinct. I would imagine that somebody who was knocked so hard out of his skin, so young, my experience tells me that that doesn't happen to people who don't have extreme, terrifying experiences. And that would be my opinion on being mm. with you. There's only so far um, anyone can go um, sat in front of a TV camera. I realise that. <laughs> and your instinct could be right. But what we have done is gone a long way down the road that I think um, I'd never been down before. The thing about Paul is that I don't know whether I've actually got through to him or not and whether therapies kind of reached Paul or not, almost more than any other client, because that's quite common in therapy for me not to know. The difference with Paul is that he will attach himself to strong women and comply with strong women. And I am exactly that, I'm a strong woman. So has he just complied with me or has he actually done the work? Only time will tell. I'm still a complex character. Still, yeah. Still lots of issues, but no. Oh. I know now. I have knowledge now. Thank you. Hmm. Could do with a pint of beer. 